Hey folks, welcome to lecture 11. In this lecture, we're going to start focusing on the angiosperms. Lecture 11 is mostly focused on the general essential biology of angiosperms. And then our second lecture, we're going to explore diversity in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much for the positive feedback on lecture 10. It's a great joy for me to take you on virtual field trips and show you some examples of the plants we've been talking about in order to bring plant biology a little bit more to life, despite the remote instruction. We have a second exercise coming up that's gonna be focused on a conservatory tour. And don't forget that the plant growth experiment is ongoing, and I'm gonna provide an update for you in this lecture. Please remember that if my office hour times don't work for you, I'm happy to meet up with you outside of those normally scheduled hours. If you have conflicts, I want to work with you in an effort to meet with you and answer any questions that you might have. Let's get started. Let's do a quick update about uh, what things look like in the greenhouse. Remember, we're measuring length, but we're also having a look at color. And I want to show you that here are, we are starting with that fert, fert, so the fertilized soil and fertilized water. And you can see that the plants look really healthy. They're mostly growing straight. We have one odd one that's growing here that's a little bit crooked, and so it doesn't look quite right. But when you look at the plants overall, you can see a whole you know, wealth of big leaves and everything looks really bright and looks great. When you go to the fertilizer treatment, you see more or less the same thing. Um, the other ones maybe get a little bit more fertilizer from the soil, but again, really healthy growth. The plants look really great, nice, uh, tall, straight, and very green. When you get to the DI water, here are the DI water plants, you can see that um, the leaves look mostly okay, but if you look at the stems, the way they're growing, they're definitely not growing as straight and they look a lot smaller and more spindly. So if I compare something like this to, you know, something like this over here in the fertilizer treatment, you can see there's a pretty substantial difference. Um, and of course, some of them aren't even growing straight. They have some odd patterns of growth. And that's really emphasized in this industrial water this plant in particular looks really goofy. It's a little bit hard to measure. Some of the other ones have sort of uh, fallen down and they're trying to right themselves. We'll stake those just to keep everything even. But even the best ones, you can see that um, they do have some good leaf uh, leaves on them. But again, that stem is really spindly and things just are growing a little funky. Look at this one in the back here you can see it looks actually really strange. And so we're starting to see some effects and stay tuned and we'll see what happens as we go on through the quarter. Let's take a moment to have a look at the progress of our plant growth experiment. So I went back on Monday, just like I do every single week and had a look at how things were doing. One thing for sure is that our plants grow several inches each week. So remember, our four groups are the fertilizer, soil, fertilizer, water, the fertilizer, water, but nutrient-poor soil, the DI water in nutrient-poor soil, and the tap water in nutrient-poor soil. And here is the progress so far. So you can see that the FERT, FERT treatment group looks really good. Things are mostly growing very straight. The leaves are nice and healthy. The stem diameter is um, nice and wide. And you see the same thing pretty much in the fertilizer water group. Um, maybe the fert fert group looks a little bit bigger, but time is really going to um, sort of make the difference here and see if those extra little bit of nutrients make a difference. Now, when you have a look at the next two groups, you can see that the DI water and tap water groups are starting to look pretty different. So the DI water group and the tap water groups, one thing I'll point out to you as I showed you in the video is that the stem diameter is actually really small. And these plants actually need help to sort of make sure they're growing straight. 
Now, any plants that see, you see that are um, fell over, we went back and staked those up so they'd be a little bit easier to measure and hopefully keeps everything fair. Um, but you can see that there are starting to be some differences. Now, the last thing I'll point out to you is that I took um, some sort of top-down photos of what the leaves look like because again we're looking at leaf color and right now I don't see that much of a difference maybe the tap water um, leaves look a little bit more stressed the DI water this looks a little bit curled and of course I'm picking the plant that I think looks the healthiest here so it's not all of the plants but you can see a pretty you know slight difference between the different groups right now. I think this is going to change as we go on, so stay tuned and we'll see what it looks like next week. One of the long-standing questions in plant biology is why are there so many angiosperm species? If you look around here at the bog, you can see a really great diversity of several different kinds of flowers. They all have different colors, they have different shapes, they have different pollinators working on them and so the question really becomes why are there so many differences between these flowers and there's lots of reasons that people have proposed that explain this but really it's a combination of multiple reasons that we're really going to start exploring in today's lecture so for this lecture we're going to start talking about angiosperms learn a little bit more about flower morphology, and start talking about the special characteristics that have made them so diverse. In our previous lecture, we talked about the gymnosperms, and the next two lectures, we'll talk about the angiosperms. The first lecture will be focused on angiosperm biology, and the second will be focused on angiosperm diversity. Let's first revisit the general features of angiosperms. Some of this is going to be review, but it's definitely important to bring this back fresh into our mind so we can better understand the biology. Remember that broadly, angiosperms are part of the lineage called seed plants. Seed plants include the gymnosperms and angiosperms. Seed plants both make seeds and pollen, but angiosperms have some special features that make them stand out. Those features are flowers, double fertilization, and vessel elements. Recall from our previous lecture that a flower is a combination of reproductive and non-reproductive whorls. So if we look in the bottom left of this slide, we can see that the outer whorl, which is called the sepals, and the next whorl, called the petals, are both non-reproductive. The following two, which are the stamens and the carpels, are reproductive. The female parts of the flower include the stigma, style, and ovary. These three parts are collectively referred to as the carpal. If you look at this image of a hibiscus here, which we dissected previously, you can see the stigma at the top, then the style, and the ovaries at the base. On the far right, you can see the flower with the stigma at the top, then the style, and then the ovary. So if we zoom in on the structure of a flower, there are some important things to revisit. First, make sure we understand the parts that we've already discussed, the stigma, style, and ovary, which form the carpal, and then the filament and the anther, which form the stamens. Now on the inside of the ovary, we have a new structure that we haven't talked about much before, and that new structure is called the mega gametophyte. Remember, gametophytes are the product of the mitotic division of megaspores. Remember that in seed plants, spores don't leave the parent plant. So the spore never left, it just developed in place into this gametophyte. This gametophyte is important because it has seven cells and eight nuclei. These outer layers here in green are called the integument layers. There's actually multiple integuments in an angiosperm. And then you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven cells. The central cell has two haploid nuclei, so it's oftentimes referred to as N plus N. When double fertilization occurs, remember that pollen lads on the sticky stigma, it grows a pollen tube that eventually comes and pierces the megagametophyte at the area called the micropyle. When this happens, one of these cells is destroyed in the process, which you can see on the far right. 
the egg cell remains and gets one sperm to form the zygote, and the central cell gets the next sperm to form the endosperm, which is triploid. It's N plus N plus N. So the reason why we call it double fertilization is because two sperm are delivered. Notice that we never form the nutritive tissue unless fertilization has occurred. In something like a gymnosperm, the nutritive tissue to support the developing embryo is the remains of the megagametophyte. But in angiosperms, that expensive nutritive tissue only forms once fertilization has occurred. So from that perspective, you could make an argument that angiosperms are a little bit more efficient in resources. As vascular plants, all angiosperms have tracheids that comprise their xylem tissue. But angiosperms also have that larger vessel called a vessel element. It's sort of like comparing a normal straw to a boba tea straw. It's much larger in diameter and can transport a lot more water. But if you look closely, tracheids and vessel elements have a different kind of structure. The tracheid on the left is short and they're connected not only end to end, but more along a side sort of glancing connection. And so because of this and their smaller diameter, they're less susceptible to embolism. On the far right, you can see vessel elements are clearly only connected end to end. It's sort of like stacking a bunch of straws together. So they don't have as much sideways connection. If you look at the scanning electron micrograph on the right, you can see that the smaller holes are the tracheids and the larger holes are the vessel elements. Let's next put angiosperms into context in terms of their diversity relative to other plants. Within angiosperms, we have several lineages, but we tend to break these up into three. One are the so-called basal angiosperms. Those are represented by several different groups, most notably the magnoliids, star anise, water lilies, and amborella. Then there are the monocots, and then there are the eudicots. Basal angiosperms is often also referred to as the anita grade. It's really amazing to think about angiosperms in the context of diversity. Most of the plants that you know, in fact about 90% of plant diversity, are angiosperms. And when you look at the flower shapes and sizes, they come in an amazing variety of shapes and sizes and colors. We saw some of that at the bog early on, but if you look at some of these examples here, it's actually really striking to see the differences between the groups. Angiosperms include things like sunflowers. They include things like dandelions, which are completely different in size. Of course, the grasses, etc. So amazing diversity in shape and size. In addition to the characters of other seed plants, angiosperm reproduction involves flowers in many different pollination strategies. So because they are seed plants, they make both seeds and pollen. But angiosperms are most famous for their association with specific pollinators. Insects are the most famous, bees, flies, beetles, butterflies, and moths are really important pollinators of angiosperms. But there are non-insect pollinators of angiosperms that are important as well, most notably hummingbirds and bats. However, keep in mind that many angiosperm species are not pollinated by animals. They are in fact wind pollinated. Good examples of these are things like grasses and corn. Despite the fact that they're so diverse and have been the focus of most of the study of plant biology, the origin of angiosperms still remains quite a mystery. One of the pieces of evidence and problems that is associated with this is the fact that angiosperms appear really suddenly in the fossil record. What I mean by that is that when you look in the fossil record, the angiosperm fossils that you do find have flowers that have all the parts that you would expect. There are not really any intermediates. So we would expect to find lots of intermediate stages of flowers as they evolved, but that's not really so with angiosperms. In fact, when you look at the fossil record, 
they appear quite suddenly, complete with flowers that have all the parts that you would expect. The sudden appearance of angiosperms with flowers is what is known as Darwin's abominable mystery. So Darwin predicted that we should find intermediate stages in the fossil record up to the origin of angiosperms. But in fact, as I previously mentioned, when you look at the fossil record, there really are very few intermediate stages. So Darwin said the rapid development, as far as we can judge of all the higher plants within recent geological times is an abominable mystery. Now, one thing that is promising is that there are some new fossils coming out of China that do fill in some of the gaps. However, the central problem remains. Flowers appear suddenly and without intermediates in the fossil record. Let's have another look at flowers and explore their morphology in a little bit more detail. There are essentially two different types of flowers. The first type is called a perfect flower. In a perfect flower, you have both stamens and carpels on the same flower. So the hibiscus that we talked about and dissected earlier would be a good example of a perfect flower. You have one flower with both male and female parts. In an imperfect flower, you have two separate flowers. These two separate flowers, one of which has only male parts and one of which has only female parts, can occur in a lot of different arrangements. They can be on the same plant or they can be on different plants. Recall from our previous discussion of gymnosperms that if one plant has both sexes, it is called monoecious. If there are two plants, one per sex, it is dioecious. So if you think back to the gymnosperm example, a cycad, which has separate male and female parts, that would be an example of a dioecious plant. If you look at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see that we have a yellow flower that has both male and female parts, so it has carpels and stamens. Then we have a blue flower that has only male parts, so it only has stamens, and a pink flower that only, only has female parts, so it only has carpels. So what we're gonna do is have a look at some examples of plants and get an idea of which is monoecious and which is dioecious. So there are gonna be some questions here that follow asking you to indicate which plant is which. So here's our first example. We have flowers with male parts and separate flowers with female parts. So my question to you is, what is this plant? Is this plant monoecious or is this plant dioecious? Here's our next example. We have one plant, but the flowers each have male and female parts. So again, is the plant monoecious or dioecious? And here's our last example, we have two plants. One plant which has only female flowers and one plant which only has male flowers. So is this plant monoecious or dioecious? So let's come back and review this. In our first example, we have one plant with separate male and female flowers. Because both sexes occur on a single plant, we would call this monoecious. In our next example, we have one plant with flowers that are perfect. So the flowers have both male and female parts. This plant is still monoecious. In our last example, we have two separate plants. One plant has only female flowers and one plant has only male flowers. In this example, the plant is dioecious. The big idea here is that because we have both perfect and imperfect flowers, they can be arranged differently. In the case of imperfect flowers, they can be both on a single plant or they can be on separate male and female plants. In addition to being imperfect or perfect or monoecious or dioecious, flowers also come in different arrangements. Whenever you have multiple flowers on a single stem, it's called an inflorescence. There's lots of variation here, but three of the common types are an umbel, where you have a stem tissue leading to a central point where there would be a meristem, and then you have several flowers branching off. A more complicated version of that is when you have a single piece of stem tissue, 
and then more single pieces of stem tissue, which then end in several different flowers. This is pretty common in the carrot family, and it's called a compound umbel. In the last example, you have a single piece of stem tissue, but several flowers that branch off. This is called a spike and is common in grasses. Let's now have a closer look at different kinds of fruit. Recall that fruit is a means of seed dispersal, and so it's usually derived from a mature, ripened ovary. All the examples we've talked about so far are products of a ripened ovary. This is not always true, as we'll soon learn, but invariably, fruit contain seeds. Most of the time, those seeds are on the inside, but as you'll soon see, sometimes they're also on the outside. The first kind of fruit we'll talk about is a simple fruit. A good example of a simple fruit is a plum. So one thing to know about simple fruits is that they can have one or many seeds, but they all develop from a single carpal on a single flower. Botanically speaking, we refer to these as berries. So if we look at our plum flower on the left here, you can readily identify all the flower parts that you know. Here is the carpal. You can see the ovary at the base, then we have the long style and the stigma. We also see many stamens. Here are the filaments and the anther. And then later on in the development of this fruit, you can see that the ovary is starting to ripen. And all of the other flower parts are either withering away, falling off, or just shrinking. And then ultimately, you end up with a fruit that is the ripened ovary with a single seed on the inside. Now it's important to know that simple fruits don't always have one seed. A good example of this, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is a tomato. So a tomato is also a simple fruit. It has a single carpal and a single flower, but on the inside there are clearly many seeds. The reason why it has many seeds is because inside the tomato there are many ovules. So just like the hibiscus dissection we did, when we opened up that ovary, you could see many different ovules, each of which has the potential to be fertilized and develop into a seed. The next kind of fruit we'll talk about is an aggregate fruit. An aggregate fruit result from several independent carpels being on a single flower. So if we have a look at the blackberry flower here on the left, you can readily identify the petals, you can for sure see the stamens, and then you have a mass of green stuff on the middle. And so one of the things that you should notice is that this mass of green stuff actually happens to be individual stigma, styles, and ovaries down at the base, which you can't quite see. So we have a single flower here, but on this single flower, there are multiple carpels. And so each of those carpels has the potential to be fertilized, and eventually the ovary will ripen and form its own individual little fruitlet. And so on the right-hand side, you can see what happens a little bit later in the development of blackberry fruit, where all of the other parts of the flower kind of dry up and wither away, but you end up with the resulting ripened ovaries, each of which was initially connected to one of these carpels. As further evidence of this, when you pop open a blackberry, in most varieties you can find a single seed. Now if you look at the outside of a blackberry, sometimes you see this furry stuff on the outside, and those furry bits are just the leftover remains of the flower. A multiple fruit is a variation of the two fruits that we've just talked about, and they are the result of the fusion of multiple flowers, so multiple independent carpels come together and fuse. The classic example of this is a pineapple, where on a pineapple, what you see are several independent flowers, each of which has its own carpal. So what happens is, is when these get fertilized, all of the independent flowers eventually fuse together. When this happens, that's how you end up with a pineapple. As the independent carpels, the ovaries on the independent carpels continue to ripen, they kind of end up growing together, and you end up with those sort of husky bits on the outside of a pineapple, and those are the remains of the flowers. 
So again, a multiple fruit is the result of the fusion of multiple flowers, each of which has its own carpal. Let's step back and try to apply what we've learned and think about our concept of a berry. So remember that a berry is formed from a single flower with a single carpal. Now it's important to not get confused. Berries can have multiple seeds. The multiple seeds result when you have multiple ovules within a single carpal. So that hibiscus, for example, is a great example of this where at the base of the ovary, you have multiple different ovules, each of which can form into its own seed. So a tomato would be a really good example of this. So here we have blueberries, strawberries, kiwi, and banana. Let's explore these in a little bit more detail by answering these play posit questions. One of the lessons that comes from that series of questions is the whole idea of strawberry. Well, in fact, strawberries are not berries at all. In fact, when you look at them, they have kind of something kind of unusual going on where you end up with seeds on the outside. So whenever you have a fruit that's formed from tissue that is not exclusively part of the ovary, you have something called an accessory fruit. Now, strawberries are unusual and that their seeds end up being on the outside. When that happens, they're called an achene. And whenever you look at a strawberry flower, you could see it looks a little bit like what you would think a blackberry would look like, but because some of the fruit is actually formed from non-ovary tissue, that means it's an accessory fruit. The droop that you're most familiar with will be a peach. So think about a peach for a moment. You've eaten all the fruit on the outside, and you end up with a hard pit on the inside. Now right now you might think, well that pit on the inside is the seed, but that's not exactly the case. So next time, take that pit and crack it open with a pair of pliers. Inside that pit is where you will actually find the seed. And so for that reason, peaches and other droops are oftentimes referred to as stone fruits. The last fruit we'll talk about is really interesting because it's something that you probably eat almost every day, and that's corn. So you might want to think for a moment what corn actually is. And so if you've ever shucked an ear of corn, you've taken it off, and it had that stringy stuff at the top, those are the tassels, and if you felt them, you might remember that they were a little bit sticky. And then you peeled it away, and you found something that looked something like this where that stringy stuff seemed to be connected somehow to the inside of that ear of corn. So the question you might ask yourself is, what actually am I looking at? Corn is an angiosperm, so it has to make flowers. And believe it or not, that sticky stuff that's on the outside is the sticky stigmas. So there are multiple stigmas that hang out on the outside. They have a lot of surface area, because corn is wind pollinated. And so when you peel that away, you find that each of those stigmas is connected to a single individual fruitlet. So each of these is its own independent little fruitlet. Now something that's interesting about corn is that you have an ovary wall that is fused permanently to the seed coat. Whenever you have an ovary fused to the seed coat, you have something called caryopsis. So caryopsis is really common in cereal grains. In fact, most of the cereal grains that you can think of are characterized by this fusion of the ovary wall and the seed coat. And this question, what I'd like you to consider is an apple. So we all eat apples. You can think of what an apple is like. You have that hard skin on the outside, and then you have that fleshy fruit on the inside and there are several seeds. On the left, you have a diagram of an apple flower. On the right, you have an actual picture of the apple flower. One thing to notice is where you see the seeds in relation to the rest of the flower. So think, what kind of fruit could this be of the different fruit types we've talked about? We'll finish with exploring seeds in a little bit more detail. Recall that both angiosperms and gymnosperms make seeds, they're seed plants, but 
the structure of the seed is actually very different between the groups. This is due to the origin and ploidy of the nutritive tissue. So if we look at a gymnosperm seed on the left, you can see the embryo, which is diploid, and represents the next sporophyte generation. You can see the seed coat, which is diploid, and is the product of the integument layers. And then you have the nutritive tissue. This is the tissue that will support the growing embryo. And in gymnosperms, the nutritive tissue is haploid. It's haploid because it's the leftover part or the remains of the megagametophyte. This is very different when you compare it to an angiosperm seed. The embryo is present. Of course, again, that represents the next sporophyte generation. The seed coat is present. That's also diploid and is the product of the integument layers. But now the nutritive tissue is triploid. Remember, it is the product of the double fertilization and is normally called endosperm. Lastly, the whole seed is surrounded by the ripened ovary wall, which is usually fruit and is diploid. With so many different angiosperm species, the seed anatomy can be quite different among the groups, but there are five essential parts to know. Those are the seed coat, the endosperm, the cotyledons, the radical, and the hypocotyl. If we look at the seed on the bottom left here, this is a bean seed. First, you can notice that you have the seed coat. That's something we've already talked about. Again, that seed coat is diploid and is the product of the fusion of the integument layers. Then if you look on the inside, you have something that's referred to as the stored food or the cotyledon. In beans, what happens is that young developing embryo quickly absorbs all of the endosperm. And so you end up with these cotyledons. And if you've ever watched a bean seedling grow, you'll notice that as it comes up out of the ground, you see that the bean sort of remains attached to the top of the plant. That's because those cotyledons end up being part of the embryonic seed leaves. So as they come up, they kind of still remain attached and eventually new leaves are grown. The other parts of the bean seed that you should notice are one, the hypocotyl, which is the embryonic stem, and two, the radical, which is the embryonic root. If you look at the germination of the bean seed, you notice that the radical comes out first, and the hypocotyl is the upper extension. As the bean seedling grows, the hypocotyl extends, and that cotyledon appears above the surface. If you think back to our previous discussion of the difference between fruit and seeds, Right now, you may be thinking that fruit are always soft and squishy and sweet. But remember, fruit enclose seeds for the most part. Strawberry might be kind of a funky example, but either way, not all fruits are soft and squishy and sweet. So all the examples you see here are actually also fruit in their own way. So this cockle burr up in the top left here is definitely not sugary sweet. It's hard and sharp and pretty pokey, but on the inside of that cockle burr are several seeds. So botanically speaking, it's actually a fruit. This includes all the things that get stuck in your socks when you go running, and things as dramatic as the devil's claw, which is really big, very sharp and pokey, definitely not anything sugary and sweet that you'd want to eat. Maple seeds are another really interesting example where they form this helicopter shape. You've probably seen these before on campus. And what you'll notice is that this first part up here is actually where the fruit originally was. And so this is a little bit beyond the fruit stage, but you can still see that there's a seed at the very tip of each of these wings. The last one that you might see around town is something called a sweet gum. And a sweet gum fruit looks like this and on the inside of it are seeds. In fact, each of these little holes is where you would find an individual seed. So not all seeds are soft and squishy and sweet. They can be hard and really are just meant to be attached to animals or fly through the wind, 
in order to be dispersed. In this lecture, we introduce the angiosperms. Remember that angiosperms are seed plants, and as seed plants, they share pollen and seeds with gymnosperms. But they have several features that distinguish them, including flowers, double fertilization, and vessel elements. Please also know that their seeds are distinctly different from those of gymnosperms. You should be able to label the anatomy of an angiosperm and a gymnosperm seed and relate that to aspects of their life cycles. In the next lecture, we'll talk about angiosperm diversity, and I'll take a field trip to the conservatory so you can see some examples of the different plant groups. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.